it is my pleasure to introduce Alex Boyd and Cal Flynn. Cal Flynn is an award-winning and widely acclaimed writer from the Highlands of Scotland. She writes literary nonfiction and long-form journalism. Her first book, Thicker Than Water, about frontier violence in colonial Australia, was a Times Book of the Year. Her second book, Islands of Abandonment, about the ecology and psychology of abandoned places, was shortlisted for a number of prizes, including the Wainwright Prize for writing, writing on co Global Conservation, the British Academy Book Prize, and the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction. Alex Boyd is a landscape and documentary photographer, printmaker, and writer. His work is primarily concerned with landscape in Scotland. As a photographer, his work examines the role of early Scottish landscape, landscape photographers, often using antique cameras and processes. For years, militarized landscapes have been a focus of Alex, who has explored parts of the estate of the MOD, the Ministry of Defence, one of the biggest landowners in Scotland. So now I'm handing over to you and Cal. Good evening. Hello. Hi. Um, do you mind if I start, Cal? No, go ahead, please. <laughs> okay. um, I just want to say thank you um, uh, to everyone for organising this and to Ian for um, for his introduction to the RDR. Um, obviously, you and I have a shared interest in the RDR, um, and I, I was um, I actually first came across your work through the RDR when you wrote for the I believe it was the the Guardians, um, was it the Country? Um, can I just diary. ask what Country Diary? What is it that drew you to the RDR in particular? Well, um, so I got in touch with Ian and his colleagues on the RDR campaign in the very early days of, of working on the book that ended up being Islands of Abandonment. And so I was interested in this idea of ecological value in brownfield sites. And um, there is a sort of famous example that's quite well reported in the south of England and can be Wick um, in Essex. And I guess I was looking for for other examples and ideally closer examples. So um, I came across coverage of um, our deer and thought that it was kind of a perfect example of the kind of thing that I was looking at, this site that had been both, it, it was somehow dangerous or it had this dangerous past and there was a, a sense of, of threat through it, but that it had been left for a long period of time and that it was becoming a sort of beautiful thing. And the fact that it was under threat again was um, I guess the, the sort of news hook because I first covered it for a, a magazine called The Scottish Field. All right, yes, Scottish Field. Okay. Now, I was always curious as to what drew you there. And yeah, I think you've described a lot of the elements which do, which have drawn yourself and me to uh, locations which are kind of peripheral, um, but do have these kind of multi-layered um, elements to them. Um, I mean, sorry to jump in. Um, I, just handed my I just handed my PhD in, so um, I'm glad to say that's out of my life. Thank you. Um, but I was looking at Foucault and uh, the concept of heterotopia. Uh, places which are neither, for people who are not familiar with the term, neither utopia or dystopia, these places which exist sort of on the periphery, but they're needed for society to function. And uh, places like munitions factories uh, are one of them, uh, prisons are another, uh, brothels perhaps, the places which are part of society, but the places that we're not, we need uh, to go th several layers of access to get into, they're guarded places, places maybe we don't want to look at. And that's what you described there with the idea. I think you've you've covered a lot of those elements of danger and then moving from um, having this role in society to inhabiting another one. And with your book, Islands of Abandonment, that's what really drew me into it, is these places which have kind of really changed their form and kind of their function to something else, you know. Um, does that make sense uh, in terms yeah. of... Yeah, absolutely, because uh, I think there's a, a lot um, similar to your work in the military zones of the bombing ranges mm -hmm. and so on this idea of I don't know the, the sort of overwhelming aesthetic that comes through and those images at least my eyes is this sort of sense of peacefulness and yet it's threaded through with this sort of threat or something sinister mm -hmm. in the image as well I mean how do you approach making photography like this um well I tend to what interests me as a photographer is to look at depictions of Scotland. Um, I lived on the Isle of Skye for a year and, um, you know, I, I grew up um, between Ayrshire and Argyll. Um, so uh, bombarded with kind of picturesque pictures of Scotland, the kind of, you know, tartan 
thing. And with Sky in particular, which you know I know you're very familiar with with your connections there, um, um, to know that through a certain lens, um, I was always interested in the other um, sides of Sky. Um, for example, Rasse, I, I knew that, for example, through the work of Sorlin McLean, and I knew both Halleck, but also Skripadal, the poem, which talks about nuclear submarines exercising there. You know, and when I first moved to Scotland, I moved to Dunoon and in Argyll uh, on the American military base there. So I had this absolutely beautiful picturesque landscape with these huge nuclear submarines going past my house every day. And that tension is, I think that's always been interesting to me because I think in Scotland, there's things we talk about and things we don't talk about and putting some of those lesser palatable things into, I mean, they're in the public consciousness, but kind of poking and prodding. Um, I mean, for example, the show at Stills, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me commercially to show an exhibition on bombed out landscapes. You know, it's not, no one wants pictures of craters and burned out tanks uh, on their wall, but, you know, there's a certain social responsibility to maybe talk about, you know, what happens in this country and how that has a wider impact. And, you know, in your work where you've written about uh, the effect on the environment and what's happening in these places, you know, I was really quite drawn to these, the kind of the toxicity of the sludge in that place you visited. Uh, was it in, um, uh, in the eastern Jersey. coast of mm -hmm. New Jersey? And just the kind of, you know, the layers of kind of horror in terms of people working there, but also that they're there in the strata. Um, I think it's important to to tease that sort of thing out and the kind of the way that that's spread out, like Fukushima or, you know, any of these sites which have a much wider um, wider connectivity. So, yeah, for the work that I've done with the military sites, I you know wanted to talk about what's happened here. Sure, yeah, there's burned out tanks and all that sort of thing. That's kind of, in a way, it's kind of trite. You know, I mean, there, there's a, a destroyed uh, British Army vehicle. But, you know, that vehicle was in Northern Ireland. Um, I traced the, the plates on it, you know, it was used by people like my father who are in Ireland, you know, it's been used as part of British campaigns um, all over the world. That type of vehicle there, uh, the uh, Saxon, is currently being used in Ukraine. Um, that image is from Cape Wrath. The US military have been training there for the, you know, um, for whatever happens next. And the defence of state is being used to train Ukrainian troops. So I was trying to show that um, there's a wider picture here um, and to kind of get people's attention you show them pictures of burned out vehicles and then you use that as a way in you know for it's kind of like with, with your own if you don't mind me saying I'm sorry I'm talking so much here I will yeah. shut up in a second <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you get people with a story you know you tell them you show them something um, maybe something horrifying something problematic and then you use that to then like that image you know uh, of an insurgent um, at Tain bombing range uh, makes you start to ask questions about the wider relationship with things and social responsibilities of either our military or um, yeah, um, companies, uh, polluters and so on. Um, do you want to talk maybe some of the things maybe you've uncovered or sure, yeah. the role of your work? I think uh, there's there's definitely sort of similarities here in the sort of the, it's, it's sort of part way between documentary and art right which is that you 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 roll into these images or feelings or or imagery whether that is photography or or in metaphor um in mm -hmm. this sense that it is to get a, a reader or a, a viewer emotionally engaged and therefore dealing with the bigger issues and it's sort of this um idea of I don't know what is it that presses our emotional buttons, and um, I think often the the examples that I went to in in islands of abandonment, so whether that be sort of the Chernobyl exclusion zone or other exclusion zones, like the one on the island of Montserrat, um, partly choosing these sort of worst case scenarios um, is is an aspect of storytelling, but it's also true events. You know, this is. Mm -hmm what you choose to focus in on helps the the impact of the 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 topic that you're writing about i think is is probably the way that i come into it and i i think i see parallels in your work as well yeah it's an important function i think you know uh, to, to to do that role not to have i suppose the the danger as well as um perhaps some people who do these things is that they 
like there's a crusading element but you kind of have to look at you know your reasons for doing this sort of thing um if that makes sense um but yeah looking at some of the examples you've given of chernobyl and so on or, or montserrat yeah um i've got your book here actually i I'm going to ask you some questions later on, if that's okay. Um, you, you, I got your book a long time ago, so I've had a long time to sit with it and to think about some <laughs> of these things. And you know, um, you know, I've travelled with your book as well. And um, when I came back last year, um, as Anne mentioned, I showed in Gerloch. You know, your your book actually came up a number of times. Um, you were on. Um, I was actually asked to be on a program on Grunard Island, and then I moved to Australia um which you then you were on and you were fantastic because you you talked about many of these issues you know um because the place of Grunard for example um is that somewhere that interested you growing up in the highlands that's something I've always wanted to kind of ask you about yeah yeah it's a sort of interesting one um I considered it for the book originally and then it was difficult to just build an environmental narrative yeah. around it right it's just such a strange case and in many ways, the the so for those who aren't aware, the story of Grunyard is it's a small island. It's off the west coast of Scotland, and um, it was used as a site of anthrax testing. And and so there is some quite grisly footage dating from that period when they would tie up sheep and and sort of poison them with anthrax and then record the impact of it. And then for quite a long time, the island was completely off limits due to the anthrax in the soil. It's since been sort of cleaned up and is now used for sheep grazing and so in in many ways the danger is largely in our minds there have been no reported cases of anthrax poisoning mm. since the 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 cleanup for some time and so mm. it still has this sort of lingering sinister overtones certainly in the mind of the minds of the humans around it um whether or not that translates into something in in reality is is difficult to say and and i think certainly most people feel that sort of that that there is still some risk in going there and and it, there's a i don't know would you call that a sort of taboo around the island something like this that sort of hangs on in our minds yeah i think so there is there's is an element of but also that's alluring for some people as well um yeah. i mean have you that's in terms of the taboo um that does draw in another audience um have you spoken much or have you had much communication from people interested in say dark tourism i mean that's such a how, how do you feel about that in terms of people following in the trail of uh these kind of problematic sites yeah yeah it's an interesting one because certainly like the allure is a really interesting thing to think about like why is it that these places fascinate us or certainly many people um, and, you know, I have a complicated relationship because, of course, that must be true of myself as well. There's a reason that I've gone to these places, which is that I'm interested in them. There is a strange comfort in confronting these worst case scenarios and, and sort of studying what happens next. Um, and so I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. When, when I went to Chernobyl, so this was back in end of 2017 and of course the situation there has entirely changed but um mm -hmm. at that time it was surprisingly easy to gain access to the zone though in fact there were a number of um outfits where you could turn up only a couple of days before put your paperwork in and they'd take you in and that had this very sort of lurid imagery around all of these companies that mm -hmm. they would have orange and bright green and sort of nuclear trefoils everywhere and they all had slightly mm -hmm. different names and they 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 drew people in because people are fascinated by it, and so I I knew from the beginning that there there had to be somewhere in between, which is to deal both mm. with the the human tragedy of the site, and yet yes. also tap in somehow into what is it that that makes it alluring? Can you can you do mm. both of them and and still because to to go fully one way I felt was some somewhat tasteless because it means that you're ignoring the human costs. Yeah, I mean that's very true. I mean. Um... To, if you don't mind me visiting your other book, um, Thicker Than Blood. Um, oh, Thicker Than Water, yeah. Thicker Than Water, sorry. Yeah, it's my, um, I'm terrible with idioms. Um, the, so uh, Thicker Than Water, um, you obviously travelled here to Australia and you, you've had conversations about the role of colonialism and your family's role within that. Um, we're both from backgrounds where our families have been uh, perpetrators um, of crimes, I suppose, from like my German side, I suppose. 
and um, also my grandfather on the Scottish side, he was the other side, he worked uh, at the end of the war uh, to after the liberation of Bells and so things like uh, trauma and sites like that have held an interest for me in terms of visiting, coming to terms and trying to understand um, how these places operated and how they, what kind of function they fulfill. But in your, your book on Australia, um, did you find that helpful to go through through that process of of, come, of um, that reckoning, as it were? Did it, sorry, did it even feel like a reckoning? It, it felt like something approaching a reckoning. So the, the, the idea was that I'd find someone in my family tree who had been an explorer and, and latterly the um, suspected to be the, the leader of, of, of genocides in a, a part of um, Victoria. And um, it was, I don't know, it's a very complicated um, discussion. You know, a lot of the, the conversations I had with the, the Ghana Kurnai people who, who live in that region um, were sort of, of course, sort of freighted with this like historical yeah. meaning. And yet there are also conversations that are happening in the present day. They're sort of endlessly human. They are, you know, you can talk about these huge ideas about um, guilt or reparations or, or whatever it is on one hand, and then in the next moment be talking about your favourite bands. And so it's like a very strange thing to to navigate and negotiate. And I think um, to some extent it's a reckoning. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I. I. I still think that there's not a, a a terribly clear way forward. In as much as, like, like with the sites and islands of abandonment, these sort of past events can't be undone. Um, mm, yeah. And so the the anxiety that one carries around about them, where do you put it? And I think that that yes. that often came to be sort of what the my sort of internal <laughs> internal monologues throughout that book sort of became which was like this can't be undone so what does that mean you know and I think that yeah. that's that's sort of a similar uh, parallel yeah I'm sorry to it's a very difficult question and I perhaps um worded it quite badly it's um yeah the idea of these traumatized landscapes and how we how we reflect and how we um how we work with those in a way and I think that's coming on to your you know islands of abandonment you know that's I mean, it sent me off on all, and I'm sure pretty much everyone who's read your book it set set them off on all these tangents, which you know, hours and hours have been spent on Wikipedia and then and books and you know, which has been a kind of a delight, but also quite terrifying as well. Um, so yeah, working from that book, um, I was going to ask you, um, you live in Orkney now? Yes. Yes, right. So Stroma. Um, that's um you must pass that i guess on the ferry is that right so yeah, yeah. um yeah um is, is it kind of a different site in some respects do you think to the others or is it does it fit within so we have a couple of abandoned islands between orkney and the mainland um one is called mm -hmm. swana and one is called stroma mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. have in some ways a similar story but a very different um contemporary situation so with stroma there are more buildings it's very sort of picturesquely ruined mm -hmm. um, it, there's a there's an old phone box there's an old church um it's it's, it's quite a large community that that was there and it mm -hmm. emptied out around the same time as as Svona did um but at the moment stroma is being grazed with sheep whereas Swona mm -hmm. um has this band of, of feral cattle sort of wandering around and they take care of themselves completely and so um yes. i ended up being interested in this sort of idea of the feral but for both of them certainly from a, a a taking images point of view both of them have yes. a very similar atmosphere um a very yeah. interesting one have you been up to these islands yourself i've passed them on the boat and i have looked for those um for those uh, cows those feral cows you know. <laughs> uh, so yeah it's, this was this was years ago um i was kind of drawn to the story of of those islands um seeing the buildings that you pass by and um i've got a friend who's who's visited there linda ross and i think she um she's quite taken by by that story. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we have islands. Um, my uh, great aunt and uncle used to uh, look after an island called Little Cumbrae on the Clyde, uh, which doesn't have anyone living on it now. Um, it's got a huge country house on it, uh, which isn't occupied um, and had a garden, a garden which was laid out by Gertrude Jekyll, a famous um, landscape design, uh, garden designer. And I visited there with a friend of mine years ago just to see what it was like, because it's got a number of cottages and it's got a phone box and 
you know, a castle and just trying to sort of piece together what life was like there for those people. Um, and again, not really anything grazing there, but just sort of trying to work out how a community fit together, uh, which is, I think, you know, what you, you've done very well uh, with, with your work um, is sort of um, looking at those multi layers and how they existed then and to now and, you know, the responsibilities. Um, yeah, because I do think so, we've got yeah. sort of a, a fascination, particularly with with islands. I mean, you, you <laughs> so there's there's that when you think about not only the the tiny world that exists on the island, um, especially yeah. islands of this, this size, but also how fragile they are, how sort of quickly that yeah. that society can sort of crumble away. But you've you've um, got some very beautiful images of of Saint Kilda. I mean, I was wondering, would you just mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about the the creation of those images? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so St Kilda, um, I've got the familiar, a familial connection there. My great uncle, who I just mentioned there, who's called Jimmy, he's an early member of the SNP. He wore a kilt all the time, spoke fluent Gaelic, and um, walked around, uh, visited islands with a Leica camera. So sort of um, someone I looked up to as a child, um, used to spend his, had no kids, so spent his summers working on puffers. Anyway, he was he went with the National Trust uh, to St Kilda as a, in a, a work party, um not too long actually i think um after the end of the second world war uh sorry once at operation hard rock when the uk military moved to st kilda and mm-hmm. i had his stories of st kilda which were of the community uh what was lost and what was retained and i also had the other side which was from my father uh, who's a royal artillery officer and uh, he always saw st kilda as this awful posting that you'd be sent to like as punishment almost you know which I'm sure no one who's ever visited uh, Herta would ever say it's an awful posting. <laughs> um, maybe if you work for the National Trust. But yeah, so I was always quite interested in the kind of the tension there between um, the sort of nostalgic uh, conception of St Kilda, the romantic, uh, you know, the images of people leaving in 1930, and also the, its role uh, on the edges of the largest uh, military uh, training uh, one of the largest um, rocket ranges in the world, you know, and how it's used to track uh, our newest, um, the newest weapons that NATO develop. And so I always find that quite quite uncomfortable. So when I went to Harta for the first time, yes, I, I had a quick walk around Village Village Bay, but I made up, I made my way to the uh, the radar installations on the hill and photographed the old uh, military base, um, uh, which was there um because i had friends who'd worked on herta and they told me about they, they never talked about the um they never talked about the 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 old village they talk about things like the three-story high diesel generator and they talk about sectarianism in the local puffer, the local bar that was there and you know chasing animals and so it's a completely different idea than the kind of national trust conception so yeah i think that's that's always what draws me in as a photographer is um the other kind of story you know uh and I've done that a few times. I did a book on Lewis and Harris, which was on, um, I worked with an archaeologist, uh, Dan Hicks, on that book. And Jonathan Meads, who's a, an architectural critic, uh, amongst many other things, TV presenter. Uh, he brought a program called Isle of Rust. And the book was all about um, what we leave behind in landscapes. Um, and the book was meant to be sort of a parody of picture postcard books, uh, lots of rusty old things in fields and um, the idea was not to make fun of life on Lewis and Harris. The idea was really to talk about, you know, all the detritus we leave behind and the stories behind that, the shipwrecked um, vessels that were there, the, the you know, crofting and the, uh, I'm, I'm trying to explain this very quickly. Yeah, so there's a bus there which took people from uh, Tolsta into, into Stornoway. And I lived on the island for a couple of years and it was really interesting to kind of see this side of the islands. So, um, and the way that people reuse things. Um, so that's what really got me about Lewis and Harris was that um, there's a, a shilling village called Kushadar. Have you been to north? Have you been to the north of Lewis before? Uh, um, briefly, briefly. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, in Ness, uh, there's a shilling village, and um, it's out on the moor. It's a bit of a walk, uh, but you get out across the moor, and there's buses here, and then old shacks there, and they've all been turned into summer shillings. You know, much in the way that uh, when we, people practice transhumanance, um, they go out in the summer and they have summer to go and spend some time. And um, the book's got a number of those kind of things. So I was really fascinated with the relationship between islanders and their landscapes and how those are somewhat different, perhaps, to the more kind of Kuthi 
presentation of Scotland, which drives me slight, slightly insane. That's why I take pictures of bombed out landscapes. So yeah, that that's um, an abandoned croft. That's kind of more your tourist picture to lure people in. And then you kind of start talking about um, kind of other issues. Yeah, so um, my, my work's always tried to sort of do a line between um, this kind of, I shouldn't call my own work a name, but you know, you kind of picturesque postcard stuff, but then you have the heart, more hard hitting stuff. So in this book, for example, I had images like that and then cars which have been crushed and impacted next to it from like car accidents on the island or um, the detritus from salmon industry. Um, you know, I tried to have quite jarring things together, um, which follows Jonathan Meath's work. Um, anyway, sorry, I've gone on a long... long no, long no, but I think it's interesting. I was talking to a historian recently who was reflecting on how, you know, this idea of objects and object history and the stories that they tell about yeah. us how we have and some and we'll have a museum and it's it's full of these beautifully cared for objects with narratives around it but really like the the true archives are the rubbish dumps or the the you know these yeah. are the honest ones of how things actually worked and and you don't need to put a narrative onto them because they are evidence in and of themselves and I think you know it to some extent you know if you have a craft with all the machinery that they've ever used just laying out in the front that is a um, inadvertent museum of crofting life just just building up there exactly i mean and that's what really drew me on the islands um the last book i brought out which is this exhibition here um i used to live in bragger on the west coast of lewis and i'd spend so long going to the local um the, the cope the tip uh to see what was there you'd have like all these springs from old vehicles coming out of the soil over here was a burned out mail van you know there's like lots of um examples of people's lives um some of which still happen some which don't and yeah you're completely right like for archaeologists it's a dream and that's that's something which has always interested me i suppose is just that layering uh, with these landscapes and it's what obviously draws you as well i think you know yeah absolutely um, we went to that similar um you know we talked a bit about uh new jersey and the coastline around there and staten yeah. island earlier and there's this um the reason i went there really not knowing exactly what the chapter would be about was to go and see this this ghost ship graveyard a ship mm, graveyard yeah, yeah. The, uh, you know decades worth of ships ending sort of early 20th century um just mm. slowly sort of mouldering away and, and what had happened was that a guy who kept a what would you call it a, it was a tip a, a scrap merchant had gathered yeah. them together and then I think he couldn't face taking them apart it just seemed to you know yeah. sacrilegious so he just let them pile up and there was hundreds and hundreds of them some of them in the mud some of them floating around a lot of them really wrecked and falling apart but yeah. it was an incredible sight you know and New York Times has written about it as this sort of like museum of of nautical or seagoing history and it stores so much in it without you even attempting to. The act of not clearing it away has achieved something. Ah, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I love that because in the Clyde, um, there's the uh, the Bowling Basin. Um, they've got all these ships just wrecked all over the place and that's what I thought of and I just wonder if, if um, I think the former curator of the Scottish Maritime Museum is listening to this. So, you know, uh, send your people down there to look at some uh, interesting nautical history if you can. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, I completely agree with you. There, there's so much potential in these places. Um, so, yeah. And with the um, going back to the idea again, um, our conversations and um, uh, conversations with Ian have led to um, Birkbeck University in London, their archaeology uh, team led by Leslie McFadden. They're now interested in the in the modern archaeology of our dear, you know, the idea of, you know, this is where women worked um, during the Second World War. And those walls there are covered in the most beautiful graffiti. Some of it, have, some of it have seen, but some of it wonderful kind of, you know, telling the story of the women who worked there. And um, they want to capture that and i'm coming back to scotland in a couple of months to hopefully help with that um because that's part of um coming from ayrshire it's like part of our local history you know um and kind of rediscovering these places which have been abandoned but they're actually these perfect time capsules you know is, is kind of amazing sorry my daughter's in the background about to go to sleep so uh if you hear if you hear some noises that's what's going on <laughs> But yeah, no, I think that that was very much sort of the experience of being on Swana with them um, stepping yes. into some of the, well, particularly Rose Cottage, which is the last inhabited cottage on the island and, and 
a lot of the belongings were simply left because they are not valuable, were not valuable, are becoming increasingly valuable because of their sort of surprising perseverance or their surprising survival and and the way that they act, as you say, like a sort of time capsule from that era. And it can be difficult. You know, a lot of these objects would not have been notable at the time there are things like mm. newspapers salt shakers things like this and and they become significant they become, partly yeah. through the context I, I completely agree um i, I did about i drove about two thousand kilometers about two weeks ago um as you know with australia you cannot drive big distances if you want to see things and i went to gualia which is a ghost town i don't know if you've heard of it um my father-in-law is an architect and back in the 1980s um because in australia they like to dig really big holes and look for gold and things like that the the world's deepest um gold mine is in gualia and um it's been, gualia being the old name for wales um anyway there was a whole village on the site um around gualia and when they wanted to to further um extract uh, gold from there they, they had to work out what to do with the village. Now the village has a quite an important um, history because it had this huge Italian community there, but also the person who ran the site was uh, Hoover, who then went on to become the US president. So the site has this really bizarre, you know, kind of history to it. So the, my father-in-law, Mike, uh, he actually moved the entire, um, the pit, the head pit, and then a lot of the buildings from the mine as well. So I went to actually visit the site where they've reconstructed the old buildings there and when they took the buildings apart, they found all like the old newspapers and various items from people's lives. Uh, sorry, my, my daughter is she's got COVID uh, along with my wife, so oh, she's so. having a hard. Oh no, we can't hear it very loudly at all. So oh, don't okay, okay. <laughs> all I can hear. <laughs> I'll go and I'll go give her a hug in about ten minutes or so. But anyway, yeah. So yeah, just uncovering these histories um, and sites like that. I mean, I'm still interested in that. And Australia has so much of that kind of stuff in the um you know and the outback as it were you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i came across a, a an interesting case in in western australia that i was hoping to use for the book and then didn't quite manage to make it work but um of the the case of Wittenum, which was on the site yes. of uh, asbestos mines and mm, um, yes. at some stage around the time when they made the link between asbestos in particles in the air and mesothelemia they um mm -hmm. attempted to clear everybody out of the town and uh, removed it from the postal system removed all the signs and yet people were refusing to leave and i this this came to me almost like a sort of weird thought experiment like why would you choose to stay in a place that is killing you or would kill you mm -hmm. if you just breathe in a particle um, mm -hmm. and the particles are around you all the time. And so this was, I kept sort of coming back around to this whole idea of why people don't leave these places when they are falling apart. And Wittenum was such mm -hmm. an extreme example of that. And, and so much of it is just partly it's a sort of bloody mindedness. People don't like being told mm -hmm. what to do. And, and also mm -hmm. there's this like incredible strength of this idea of home and home place. And, mm -hmm. you know, even after you leave, that doesn't stop, even if it's sort of in your cultural history, as opposed to your personal experience, it yeah. can hang around with you. And it, that's a very strong human impulse, I think. Uh, completely. I mean, yeah, Whitnam, very well known here and somewhere, you know, I'm going to have to ask you some questions about but even um, Gualia, which I mentioned a minute ago, you know, people are proud of what happened there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was there, uh, a little blue car started pulled up and someone who was born there started telling me, I and mean, I'm sure he does it three times a day. He got out of his car, this old man, and started telling me the story about the people that lived there and where his house was and where he was born and where his parents were and how this all worked together. And it was very, you know, for me, it's very moving. I'm sure, again, he, said, he tells the story. And, but for him, telling that story several times a day keeps that community alive you know mm -hmm. and that to me is a really interesting concept and some of the places I've been to have terrible kind of legacies or terrible histories but in a way people there's a kind of a pride pride of like oh well our place is known for something you know it's it's got this place on it's got this name on the map as it were or in the, the case of Whitnam yeah they tried to remove it from the map they tried to stop people from going out there you know um, I suppose did you actually go into sorry so no no I, I suppose it sort of reflects this sort of idea of industrial heritage it's just something that mm. i think is only really being valued quite recently you know there's the way that um 
So in, in Scotland with the Bings, which were one of my mm. sites, um, so these are, are sort of huge piles of gravel from the from the oil industry in the 19th century, I, I, I think for a long time quite disliked, were genuinely quite risky. You know, they would burst into mm. flame here and there or there would be landslips. But over time, a sort of fondness creeps back in or a fondness comes to the fore and um they've they've made a, a heritage trail going between the bings and you know the this idea of industrial history as being something that was valuable and important to sort of the development mm-hmm. of of a country or its people you know and yeah. and that after the dust has settled somewhat that it can be valued once again no, I find that really fascinating. Um, coming here to Australia is, is kind of because they live with it. And in Western Australia, which is driven entirely really by um, expo- well, ore and exploitation, as it were, mm-hmm. going up to Kalgoorlie, where I went a couple of weeks ago, which has the super pit. It's called the super pit. It's like one of the largest holes on earth. You go up there and it's a tourist experience. It's like, look, look what we've done. And it's not like, oh, God, look what we've done. It's like, <laughs> look what we've here. Down here, there's a an excavator, which is something like you know, you know, um, I don't know, like twenty five meters high. It's, you know, there's a truck like that beside it, and it's like that high. You know, look at what mankind has achieved here. You know, and they are looking at that now as sort of, and that they've been doing that for 20, 30, 40, 100 years, whatever. You know, making these places, and they're proud of that industrial history in a way that you know, it's only once the dust has settled in the UK, like for example, Ravens Craig, you know, and Motherwell, you know. How is that going to, how will that pan out, the history of a place like that? Or, you know, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I really, the questions around our, our heritage, and especially that heritage we don't want to look at. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, there's lots of questions around that. And lots of opportunity as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That the, the sounds like something from an Italo Calvino story or something like this. It's quite <laughs> crazy, you know, the, the scale of it all. Um I know, that's true. And, and well, speaking of Ravens Craig, it was interesting to see that this is being sort of foregrounded in the story of Scotland at the Venice Biennale this mm-hmm. year. And so this is part of part of Scotland's story and that is being presented as as such. So I, I, I think that's a very interesting. Certainly it feels to me, although I'm sure some people watching will disagree, to be a relatively new um way of of thinking about and and even sort of celebrating the heritage of the country that moves slightly away from the the tartan and the i don't know yes uh, yeah, perhaps a yeah. more well-rounded or a um you know it's a, it's a trouble history in its own way yeah the kind of warts and all thing yeah it was, it was, i must say it was fantastic to see uh, frank michelini and i'm trying to think of his contributor uh his partner at the biennale i was so happy to see that story being told yeah Oh. All right. Anyway, hello. <laughs> okay. well, I will just jump into really briefly. Thank you. This has been such an amazing conversation, and we're so glad to have the two of you as the sort of ending point for part two of our series. And we have um, so many questions in the Q&A box. So I'll just jump right in and um, start to get your responses to some audience questions. So. Um, We have one from Ian who says, I'm really interested in the division or dialogue between the scientific approach and the artistic approach to interpreting and valuing land. Can we get those two sides to work more closely together? Um, Do you want to start, Cal, or do you want me to jump in? Uh... If if, if you've got a thought that's ready to go, I've got something I'm brewing. (laughs) Okay, okay. yeah, I'm interested in that. It's, it's hard to have conversations about landscape uh, sometimes, especially in Scotland. Um, one, of the, one of my case studies for my PhD was um, was the south of Scotland, the Dundrennan Ranges, where the MOD had been firing depleted uranium into the Solway Firth. And um, for political reasons, um, the in Scotland, that's been seen as sort of the British military making a mess of the Solway Firth and irradiating it and so on. Um, and it's seen as an imposition on Scotland. The actual science behind a depleted uranium is sort of ignored in a way. I don't condone what the MOD have done, but um, you know the idea that it's depleted uranium, but it's always framed as a, a nuclear 
incident as it were and in scotland we have a number of journalists special environmental journalists who who report stories um without perhaps a nuance there's sometimes sort to cast aspersions on on the journalistic medium um but it's hard to actually tell a story uh, in a balanced way when perhaps the mod are, are seen in such a negative way so i think we need to um yeah it's it's really difficult because the value of land and working with artists sometimes you can be this mediator between a political position you know um and uh, a political position and a force of authority um and trying to work together for a dialogue um that's and that's what i've tried to do with some of the stuff i'm doing probably unsuccessfully um but anyway that's that's the point i was trying to make it's, it's hard to sometimes get the story out because there's so much noise around it um sorry count you uh, yeah sure i mean i mean um a sort of side point which is that i feel often okay so we we have two issues here and and one of them is sort of like the aesthetics of landscape or how we value landscape from that point of view and the other it can be a more quantitative way of looking at land and that I think that in many ways there is a lot of crossover because people who are scientists or, or policymakers also think in this aesthetic way, but it can be difficult for them to express that through the, the form that they work in. And so when you read scientific papers and so on, it doesn't necessarily also deal with questions of wonder and the sublime or, you know, anything like this. And so I think the the an important thing maybe I don't know, and how do you unite those two things? I, th I, I think finding more ways of, of scientists being able to express or, or, or communicate within that medium as well is, is, is an important element. I don't know that I have the solution. It's difficult. I mean, if you're dealing with, um, I found it very hard sometimes um, dealing with scientific papers to then work through the language involved to actually get to the, to the actual core of what was going on um, in, a, in a way that most generalists wouldn't. And as you say, that kind of, it does obscure things. So yeah, sometimes having mediation between hard science and with, um, the general public and, and a better a better dialogue would help, I think, yeah. Yeah, and sure. you, you have it the other way around as well, which is sort of like sort of uninformed takes uh, which are which are based purely on emotion or, or aesthetics and and not uh you know the this is where we get the romance this is where we get the urban myth the the lack of of reality matching up with the, the way that we talk about a place i think i think finding this halfway house is is important especially in a scottish context you know uh, myth myth uh, myth building is such a, a core part of our perhaps or a core part of any national identity but that's a whole other discussion i suppose for another day <laughs> So I think if we can, we'll just conclude with two questions. I'm going to ask one that's for Cal and then combine a couple of them that will be for both of you. So the first one for Cal says, this is from Linda, who says, I'm writing about nuclear cultural heritage, including tourism to Chernobyl. Having been there, how do you think that Ukraine's pre-invasion bid to regulate tourism via government policy and its proposed UNESCO World Heritage Site application will be received by the guides in the area once tourism is able to resume. Honestly, it's a, a little bit difficult for me to comment because I don't have a strong sense of what exactly is going on with those guys in that industry in the meantime. So where those people are, will they be returning? And so, I'm not sure. Certainly for me, it's too early to say, um, possibly more generally. Thank you. And I'll, so since we're slightly over time now, I'll combine a couple of questions that I think will be a really nice way to conclude. And apologies if we haven't been able to get to your questions. Um, so the first one is, um, is on the subject of dichotomies, which um, were sort of the, the subject of the first question, how do we move away from the very specific, i.e. your discussion about islands and depopulated areas to the general? So how can we learn from these discussions to influence the future of everyday or unregarded landscapes? And then James Davidson, says, as Alex knows, I've spent many years exploring abandoned areas of Aberdeenshire, 
Recently, I've been thinking more and more about the idea that the humans have left and abandoned the areas, but not nature. I find myself going back to abandoned crofts to see how nature has changed and moved into these abandoned places. For example, daffodils pop up in the spring as does the rhubarb. Suddenly the crofts seem not so quote unquote abandoned. Any thoughts on how nature can almost thrive in areas of abandonment? So I guess these questions are about what we can learn um, from these discussions about the future of these isolated or abandoned places and then um, how, how is nature kind of now also thriving in these areas? Um, uh, well, specifically we can look at things that are already happening, which is that um, brownfield sites um, are recognized as habitats worth saving in particular circumstances. So Ian Hamlin, who spoke earlier, introduced me to the idea of the open mosaic habitat, which is one of the habitats that is, is sort of under, able to be specially protected. It's like a priority habitat in the UK. And so these are open mosaic habitats or something like, you have lots of little types of habitat close together. You tend to find them in, in sort of derelict sites. This might be like falling down bits of walls, tarmac, some stagnant pools, some I don't know, some buddlier bushes, all of which is really good for invertebrate life because it needs lots of different types of habitat during different stages of its life. And so um, part of the way that um, you might apply for a triple SI for a habitat like our deer or ones like them might be because of like these very interesting forms of life. And so that's already baked into the system in some way, which shows that our way of thinking about brownfield sites is changing and they are being valued in, in a new way. And again, this has just been in the last, I think a, a couple of decades that that, that has been a sort of recognized um, priority habitat. Yeah, I think, yeah, looking at Ian's work on the RD and just seeing like, it's, as you said, the mosaic thing, looking at the plans and the way it's been uh, subdivided, looking at that macro level, you know, not looking at the whole site, for example, as one monolithic thing, um, having that nuance is kind of, I think, really helpful. I mean, one of the questions that was asked uh, about, you know, looking at depopulated areas and islands. Yeah, I mean, in a way that sort of um, made people think that perhaps that's not where people are, that sort of that's there, you know, over there, as it were. But these sites are, you know, many of them are very close to settlements or on the edge as peripheries of well-settled areas. Or, you know, the, you can start looking at things like the parking lot and, you know, you know, during lockdown, people started looking at those small spaces within their own communities, uh, the abandoned spaces and how those could be developed. And I kind of hoped post COVID, not, not post COVID, I've got COVID right now, uh, post um, post um, the lockdowns that people might actually start looking at abandoned areas within their communities and redeveloping those. And in some cases that's happening. People have changed the way they look at their landscapes, but I'd like to see more of that continuing, like how they could utilize and redevelop places, you know, that are within their site, not over there, but here, you know, in front of them. And to answer um, the question, yeah, uh, talking about um, uh, talking about Aberdeenshire, yeah, James, and uh, cottages, yeah, your work's fantastic. And, you know, it does, you know, we have a very human specific, specific view of landscape, of course, that's, you know, but looking at animal histories is, you know, following that through uh, and looking at how animals navigate new sites and how those have an importance there. Um, it's not my area of expertise, um, but yeah, it's something we definitely need to think about uh, in terms of, of future development, I suppose. Um, Cal, you know a lot more about that than I do, you know. And, well, and just a far bit. <laughs> general point, which is like the, the romance and the myth. And, you know, these are powerful tools that we have as as humans. And I think that bringing, bringing romance to these more troubled sites does a great deal of good because there is value there and we can celebrate it.